Okay. So, as I discussed earlier, Splunk is basically a log analytics tool. Okay. So, how Splunk is working means it is going to So we are going to split our Splunk into two types. One is data gathering and another one is data analyzing. Okay. So data gathering is nothing but we have to create a setup with various Splunk components. And once the setup is ready, we are able to receive the data from the external application systems or routers or devices, whatever it may be. Okay, it should, it, uh, Splunk is able to read structured as well as unstructured data, but sometimes it will expect the data with the timestamps because you are going to search your data for a definitive time interval. So Splunk is always expecting the timestamps for your data. If timestamp is not there in your events, okay, Splunk will fix that automatically the timestamp of that particular file or timestamp when it going to hit the indexer. Those things are done, you will see later but this is the general idea because people will ask whether Splunk is able to and some of the tools in market is there they will be able to only read the structured data sometimes it may be JSON structured data sometimes it may be XML structured data okay but Splunk is not like that it is capable of reading structured as well as unstructured data even your sensor data even your SNMP traps even your router devices uh, tracks okay so Splunk is able to read whatever the data you are feed into Splunk. Okay, but it's not able to read the binary files. Okay, files which are in binary format, so Splunk will not be able to read uh, binary files, say for example, uh, uh, Java heap error files. Okay, those kind of errors we are not able to read in Splunk. So data gathering. Data gathering is nothing but you have to create a architecture setup in your environment and that architecture setup is going to get the data into the Splunk infrastructure. So that is first point. Okay. So you have to build this Splunk architecture. With the help of it, you are going to ingest the data into the Splunk infrastructure. That is the first point. So once your data is ready, you got the data. Now in your Splunk infrastructure, you have the data. So in this point of time, the data will be more or less, it is a text format. Okay. So text based files. So we are going to convert the text based files into better visualizations. Okay, so for that we are going to use this data analyzing that is nothing but Splunk development module. So in development module we are going to perform this transformation. So from the text we are going to transform into visualization. So these are the two types in uh, in the Splunk overall uh, modules. Okay, so one, you have to get the data. Second one is transform the data. That's it. So now we will see about this architecture. So majorly Splunk is having various components. Okay, we can split Splunk components into two types. One is processing component and another one is management component. So processing components is nothing but without this component, Splunk will not function. Okay, this, these are all the mandatory components in your Splunk architecture. Without this processing component, Splunk will not at all function. Okay, and management component is nothing but uh, this, without this uh, component, Splunk is able to function. But the thing is that you are not able to manage your processing components properly by itself. So in order to manage this processing components, you need at least any one of the management component. At different points of scenario, you require different management component. So we will see one by one, not an issue. And within the primary component itself, we can split into two types. One is a major, otherwise we can call it as a primary and call it as a secondary. Okay. So what are the primary components? So this is my Splunk infrastructure. Okay. Say for example, application teams are having their data in their web servers or in their DB servers. 
okay, or in their uh, routers, switches, whatever it may be. So I'm having the data in the application side environment in any one of the devices. And the device may host in any kind of OS, any kind of architecture, whether it may be a Linux flavor, whether it is a, a Starnix flavor, okay, whatever it is. And whether it is a Windows flavor or Mac OS, whatever it is. Okay, so I need to ingest the data from that application server to my Splunk infrastructure. Okay, so for example, uh, we can say that application server is having one server. Okay, the server is having so many log files. Okay, the server is, we, we, we can take that is the application server. So this application server is mainly capturing the user login activities. Okay, so the user requirement will be like this. I am capturing my user login activities okay, in, in my log file in my server. Okay, I want to build this Plum dashboard and I want to see that uh, Shrikarya, I am recording. After the class, I will forward the video. Okay. Not everyone is recording. So, I am recording today. So, I will forward the video. If not, then from tomorrow, we will make everyone is organized. Okay. Okay. So, application server is having the data within it. Okay, so I want to ingest those data into my Splunk infrastructure. And that application server may be of any OS. Okay, it may be Linux flavor or maybe Windows flavor, whatever it is. So, I want to get the data into my Splunk infrastructure. And application server's main focus would be serving the purpose of... Uh, doing the application activities, not to uh, understand the logs, not to ingest the logs, not to index the logs, okay, because it does not have that much of capacity first of all. If I am going to uh, install Splunk directly over there and going to perform everything in a single application server, then what will happen? Its primary job is going to get disturbed, okay, whatever it is, it's a UI server or it's a database server, whatever it is, its primary role is going to get uh, disturbed. Because the indexing part, the reading part, analyzing part is going to consume much of the CPU, okay, in your device. So, your device primary focus is to uh, serve the application and serve the users, not to index the data what they are doing. Okay, so what I am doing is that I have a, a Splunk infrastructure. So, what we are telling that you just to give your data, we are going to index, we are going to read, we are going to analyze. So, I need to collect the data from the application piece and get into my Splunk infrastructure. Okay. So, how I can um, collect the data from the server to my infrastructure means here, I am going to install an agent called Splunk Forwarder. Okay. So, this is a very lightweight agent and this agent is responsible, this agent is uh, having the responsibility to forward the data into my Splunk infrastructure. Okay, so this is nothing but it's a very lightweight agent. So, uh, I will tell you, so in Splunk, we are having two packages. One is forwarder package and another one is pull package. Whenever Splunk is started, we are having only one package that is known as the full package. Okay, I will tell you a simple human analogy. Say for example, I am capable of teaching mathematics, science, social science. Okay, but my principal assigned me to teach only mathematics in this month. Even though I am capable of teaching math, uh, science and social science, now my primary role is to teach mathematics only. Okay, similarly, this full package is having the capability of serving all the components in Splunk. Okay, it may act as the primary component, it may act as a secondary component, it may act as a management component based upon the corresponding configuration files what we are going to give. So, in Splunk, we are having only one package. Okay, within that package, you need to keep appropriate configuration file. So, if you keep configuration file uh, A, then it is going to act as the A component. If you keep configuration file B, then it is going to act as the B component. We will see what is configuration file, what is component later. But just to understand, we are going to invoke one package as different components based on different configuration files. Okay, so this is the full package. So, previously we are having only one full package 
and this full package only it's going to install in application end and in Splunk infrastructure ends also. But what people will feel is that, say for example, from my application server, I'm not going to do anything other than indexing, other than searching. I'm not going to, sorry, other than forwarding, I'm not going to do any indexing, searching in my application part. That and all, you are going to do it in your infrastructure. Then, why should I have this full package? Okay, say for example, this full package is capable of forwarding, indexing, filtering, Okay, so here uh, a single package is capable of forwarding, indexing, filtering, searching and managing. Okay, so people will tell that I am not going to do all these activities in my end. Okay, so I feel this is a very high weight package because this package is going to consume nearly 1 to 2 GB and if it is a... And if it is a full package means, okay, people will feel that, application pe team people will feel that, why should I uh, uh, load some heavy package into my system when I'm just going to forward the data? Why can't you give you the package which is, which is just going to perform the forwarding? So with that, say, uh, after uh, Splunk has started itself and after some two years, Splunk has released one more package called a forwarder package okay and this forwarder package is only having this forwarding capability okay not any of these things so in application servers we are not going to use the full package we are just going to install this forwarder package and this forwarder package is going to call as the universal forwarder it is a very lightweight lightweight agent it's not going to uh, consume much of your CPU that is the CPU footprint is very less in the device wherever it's going to install okay it will take very less memory it won't take much of your uh, CPU okay it won't affect your application server's performance okay so this is what the Splum forwarder package is going to do and that agent is going to call as the universal forwarder so only for and the component is named as the universal forwarder so only for this component we are going to install this full package, sorry, forwarder package. And for the rest of the components, we are going to install this plum full package. So in packages, with uh, compa taking the packages, we are having only two types of packages. One is forwarder, one is full package. Okay, forwarder, you are especially it is designed for the application team servers. We are going to install that forwarder package in that application server. And it's a minor agent kind of thing. Okay, it's not going to do anything on your application server. It's just going to collect the data from that server and feed into my Splunk infrastructure. That's it. So this is called forwarder, forwarding and universal forwarder. Okay, package, capability, component. Okay, that's it. And then full package. Still full package is having the forwarding capability, indexing capability, filtering capability, searching and managing capability. People have not removed this capability, okay. Still forwarder is also capable of doing the forwarding. But we are not going to install full package in the uh, application servers, okay. That is the thumb rule. Okay, so now what will be the second Splunk infrastructure? My application server is ready. I have installed the forwarder over there. That is, I have installed the universal forwarder component over there. Okay, and I have configured to send the data to my Splunk infrastructure. So what's there in my Splunk infrastructure? So in your Splunk infrastructure, people will call that first part of server as the receiver. So that is nothing but Splunk receiver. So Splunk receiver 
here they have referred to the Splunk indexer. It's nothing but it is Plunk indexer. So what this indexer is going to do? So indexer is the major component in the Splunk architecture. It's going to get your data. It's going to read your data. It's going to index your data. Index in the sense, it's going to store your data. And it's going to search your data. Say for example, I can say that uh, so many peoples are there. You are you are all belongs to various application teams. Okay, I will tell you the human analogy here. So everyone is going to give me a book separately. So I need to collect books uh, from all of you, and I'm going to read that book line by line from first page to thousandth page. Everyone is having the thousand pages book. So I need to get the book. And I need to read the book line by line. And I need to store the contents of the book in my mind. Okay. And say for example, someone is there. Raja is there. So Raja is going to ask any questions on me about your book contents. So in that case, I need to retrieve the data from my mind and respond to Raja. So that is called as the searching. Searching and retrieving. Okay. So very simple, this indexer is going to get the data, it's going to read the data, it's going to store the data in its own databases and that database here it's not actually a database, it's not a table kind of format. Okay, that database here we are going to refer as index. Index is nothing but it's a directory. Say for example, whatever Hemant is going to give, uh, Hemant is going to give, Charu is going to give, Priya is going to give various kinds of data. So I am not going to store everything in a single dump. Okay, because I need some classification. Say for example, if Raja is going to ask the data only Hemant is shared means, I am not able to uh, search in a single dump whatever the Hemant data is. So if I collect separately with some classification, so I am having various folders in my mind. So whatever Hemant is telling, I am going to store in that particular folder. And whatever Charu is telling, I'm going to store in that particular folder. So that particular folder is called as the index. Otherwise, it's just a directory. That's it. Okay, so a Splunk indexer is going to get the data from various servers across your application and going to store it in various index. That is nothing but a simple classification. That's it. Okay, and if someone is going to ask you later, then it, this, uh, in this indexer is going to search in its corresponding index and retrieve the data to the user who is going to ask. The users are nothing but end users like us. Okay, because uh, Raja is some end user. He is building his application. So he wanted to know how many number of uh, login has happened constantly for over a month. So in that case, he want to dig out the authentication data, whatever he has collected in Splunk, and he want to build some dashboards. So he just asked, I want the data, authentication data, what Hamath has provided. Okay, so uh, he has to write the query appropriately in Splunk, understand, in Splunk language and Splunk is going to take that query and come to this indexer and search it in its corresponding index and pick the data and give it to Raja. Then Raja is going to build the visualizations on top of it. This is called search and retrieving. Okay, so, so the single indexer is having various roles. Okay, it's going to read. Also, it needs to filter the data. Filter is nothing but it needs to filter the data. Say for example, uh, I'm having few customer sensitive data. Okay, because my data is going to have some customer sensitive credit card numbers, debit card numbers, or their uh, personal phone numbers, email ID, so many things, SSN, whatever it is. Okay, so I do not want to disclose all those details to my external user Raja because he is just an application builder. Okay, so if any of the user is going to log into my network, their log stamp is going to store their name, their mail ID, their date of birth, their phone number, credit card number, as well as some information. So Raja is need to see only the uh, authentication attempt, whether it's a success or failure, and timestamp, and the username, that's it. He is not have any authorization to see my user's SSN or my user's phone number. So I want to hide those things to the 
uh, Splunk developers or to the external users like Raja. Okay. So in that case, what I need to do is that I need to mask my data, anonymize my data. Okay. So that is called as the filtering. Not only that, say for example, so many things are there in filtering. So we will uh, see in depth later. But I'll just tell some examples. So masking is one such kind of filtering. And the other filtering is that in my application server, okay, I'm having a log file called apple.log. In this log file, this is a 100 GB log file. Okay. This log file is going to have uh, the application authentication data, okay, success or failure, whatever it is. Also, it is it is capturing few exception data also. That is useless, okay, that is useless data. But application team is capturing those data for some other purpose because they need to understand their exceptions, what they are handling and all. So they are capturing those logs in the apple.log for some other purpose. But this 100 GB log file, okay, out of this 100 GB log file, only I am having 40 GB required information. The remaining 60 GB is nothing but exception data which I do not require. Okay, so, uh, but Splunk is not a free one. How much amount of data you are going to read, for that you have to pay. So, I need to read, I need only this 40 GB from this particular file. I don't read the remaining 60 GB in that particular, 60 GB of data in that particular file. It's not various file. Within a single file, you are having authentication data as well as exception data. So, you want to discard those garbage data, that is un, uh, unnecessary data. So in that case, you need to do some filtering. So that filtering also do by the indexer. But this filtering should done before it gets stored into the indexer. Once it gets stored means you are not at all able to do anything. So before reading and storing, your data is getting filtered. Then only it is going to move to the next queue. It's all a queue. Getting is a queue. Okay, the, the receiving data is in a queue. Then it is going to the filter queue. Then it is going to the reading queue, storing queue and searching queue. That's it. Everything is a queue here. So Splunk indexer is the primary component which requires to do all these activities. So everything is a capability. Okay. But uh, people will think that okay, this filtering, this search and retrieving and this uh, getting the data from across 40,000 or 50,000 plus servers, everything is overloaded in Splunk. Is Splunk indexer. Because I am the single person, I can't handle all the universal folders. I can't handle 100 students' books and I can't answer like Raja and not only have the user Raja. Okay, like Raja, so many people are going to ask so many queries to me. So I cannot handle all the 40,000 students and I cannot handle all the 40,000 teachers. Okay, because I am not able to, either I need, I am good in reading the books, otherwise I am good in telling the response to the user. If I started to respond to each user, then I may uh, lose my primary focus on reading and writing the book. That is reading and storing the uh, book and its book contents into my mind. Okay, so people will think that the index's primary role is just to do read and store the data. Okay, so what uh, we have done is that we are going to create an agent called Splunk Searcher. Okay. For this agent, okay, this is not an agent, it's just another component. So we are going to build another component and we are going to give the search and reporting role, retrieving role to this search head. So on behalf of indexer, hereafter, the search head is going to collect the data from the, collect the queries from the users. So the queries will not directly come to indexer. Users should uh, get the data, but still my data is in my indexer. Okay, data is not in the search end. It's in the indexer only, but user should not uh, inquire my indexer directly. He has to go through this proper channel. Okay, I'll explain in architecture. So this plunk search end is nothing, but it is going to do this search and retrieving. And this getting and filtering. Okay, so this is going to take by my heavy forwarder instance. Okay, so this filtering is going to do by this heavy forwarder. That's it. So in this case, my indexer is going to just perform only reading and storing. So heavy forwarder is a component, receiver is a component, that is indexer is the component 
and Splunk search it is the component. Okay, so how my architecture will be is I'm having the application server. Okay, see for example, suppose I do not want to filter any data. Okay, my data is not have any uh, masking uh, information and I don't have any garbage data. So in that case, I do not require this filter and all. So if filtering is not required means you can directly send your data to Splunk first receiver that is indexer. Okay, so the appli from application server, your data is going to move into the Splunk indexer. So now here my data is there in Splunk format. Okay, so my end users are there. They want to uh, visualize few data. So they have to give the queries in Splunk search it. Okay, so user is going to write the queries in Splunk search it and Splunk search it take the query and search it in indexer and they get the data and respond the user with that particular data. That's it. Is that clear? And in the search it only, we are going to analyze the data and build visualizations over here. Is it clear? Okay, this is one kind of architecture. Okay, this is the first architecture. Okay, single standalone architecture. Okay, sometimes, okay, I, am, I may have some filtering and I may have some masking information and all. In that case, your indexer is not the receiver. Your heavy forwarder is the receiver, first receiver. Okay, so in heavy forwarder, application server data is going to move into heavy forwarder and then it is going to uh, read the data, it is going to filter the data, then moving into the indexer. That's it. Okay, user to data indexer is nothing but see user is going to write the queries in the search it. Search it is nothing but it is a UI part. Okay, it is a GUI part. Okay, so here users can write its own Splunk special queries. Splunk is having the commands and queries. So I need to say for example, I need to get the data what Hemant has provided. So whatever Hemant has provided, I have collected those data in Splunk index called Hemant. So I'm just going to give my query uh, index equals Hemant, okay, because I have stored everything in the Hemant's index. And out of that, I want to pick the top user who is logging into my application. That's it. So this is the query, like this kind of query you are going to use, user is going to write it and search it. This query is going to take and search uh, in this particular indexer. Indexer is nothing but it is a storage. It is a data storage. My application data, whatever I have collected, it is stored here. So, whatever the Hamanth index, okay, uh, this query is going to point into the Hamanth index in the indexer and pick the top 10 user out of that index. Is it clear, Suman? Okay, that's fine. Uh, Surinder and Ravi, are you able to pick it up? Yes, yes. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so my users are going to uh, write their queries in the search head and search it is going to pick the data from the indexer and give it back to the user. That's it. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the first architecture. And sometimes I may need to do some filtering, so I have to keep this Splunk heavy forwarder in between the application server and indexer. And this heavy folder is going to do the filtering and pass my data to the indexer. That's it. This is the second architecture. And then we will see this management component. Say for example, I am not going to have only one application server. Okay, in my environment, I may have so many servers. Okay, so in order to manage all those application servers, I need a common person and that person is going to call as the deployment server. So deployment server is the person which is going to control my forwarders. Okay, forwarders in the sense application server. Application servers. 
okay so rest of the thing is same index search it okay so this application servers are controlled by this common uh, some central master server that is called as the deployment server so this is the third architecture and the fourth architecture is nothing but we will see everything in detail in next class just i'm exploring what are all the components are there okay so our deployment server is one such a management component and the next one is nothing but see i'm not going to use only one indexer okay i i'm going to use more than one indexer in that case i need to create a cluster of those indexer so that is called as the indexer clustering and in order to manage this indexer i'm going to have some person called a master server that master server is going to called as the indexer master indexer master is a person which is going to control this indexers uh, whenever we are going to form the clustering okay so this is nothing but fourth architecture and fifth architecture is nothing i am having application server indexer now i am not having only one search it i am having more than one search it okay so in that case i need to build a cluster over here and this cluster should maintained by one person and that person is going to called as the deployer okay so deployment server is for forwarder management indexer master is for indexer management deployer is for search at management that's it okay so these are all the management components deployment server indexer master and deployer okay in addition to that in order to maintain the splunk license because splunk is not a open source it is a enterprise version how much of data you are going to read per day say for example if i want to read 100 gb per day means you want to buy a 100 gb license which is going to read per day okay so that is called as the license it is a costlier one it is a priced one okay so we have to keep that license in our environment and manage that license so in order to manage the licenses we are having a person called license server license master server okay so this person is going to maintain my licenses okay so these are all the architectures in splunk and these are all the components so for each and every component so if it is indexer master means you have to keep the server dot corner if deployment server means you have to keep server class dot corner if indexer means indexes dot corner corner is nothing but configuration file okay there will be some configuration file dot corner extension okay so for every component we are having the corresponding configuration file so whatever the configuration file you are going to keep so what a very simple idea so i'm going to take one forwarder uh, full package and if i'm going to put indexes dot corn of means it will act as the indexer and i'm going to uh, take full package if i'm going to keep props dot corn of means it is going to act as the heavy forwarder i'm going to keep take a full package if i'm going to keep dist search dot corn means it is going to act as the searcher okay so it's very simple take the package put the configuration it will act as the appropriate component with that capability okay is the architecture is clear packages components capabilities and what are all the overall holistic architecture is everyone is clear with it yeah thanks rita yeah any more doubts any doubts surender ravi priya ramya no doubts is it clear yes that's fine so i'll forward this forward the documents also okay so if any concern just let me know we will discuss uh, rest of the things tomorrow okay and now i'm just going to give you in the next five minutes i'm just going to tell you how to set up the lab because these are all the architecture uh, not ppt i am i am i am not going to use any pptes and all okay all of my things will be in notepad either in do word document so i'll forward these documents whatever we have discussed here so that's why i am i used to write during the class so it is more useful i guess i'll forward this
probably work. Okay. Okay, so the thing is that, say for example, uh, this is the architecture. So now you understand what is Splunk. So Splunk is not a single package. You can install it in your Windows and you can do the things. Okay, you need at least three to four servers to maintain one application server, one indexer, one search and every folder like that. Okay, so in that case, you require at least three to four machines. And usually in organization, people will onboard the data in Linux boxes because Linux boxes performance wise is that's good. Not only Linux, any kind of Nix flavors, whether it is Solaris, HPUX, whatever it is, Unix, Linux, whatever it is. So compared to Windows, those Linux flavors is good. Okay, so what we are going to do is that I'm going to take the Linux box in, in that to Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which is commonly used across the organizations. So we will practice everything in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. But we can't install VMWares in our machine, uh, so many VMWares, okay, and we can't uh, uh, install, uh, we can't buy the Linux uh, servers, 3, 2, 4 servers like that. So what we are going to do is that we are going to make use of the Amazon Cloud Services for free. Okay, for the first 750 hours, they are providing the free version. That is, you can run the servers as much as time as possible, only for first 750 hours. Say for example, if I am going to run one server for continuously for 750 days, each day one hour means my 750 hour is going to vanish. Okay, if I am going to continuously run 30 days, okay, 24 hours, okay, 5 server means within 30 days my 750 hours is going to complete. Okay, so we will see. So what you are going to do is that... Probably in today's class, I will tell you how to create the instances. Okay, okay. I'll just give you a demo and give that uh, uh, installation sheet. Probably with that, you can install. So, first, go to this console.aws.amazon.com. Okay. Do not worry about that. I'm having the screenshots. So, just get to know what I'm doing. That is enough. Okay. So, it is the console. So. So first thing is that you have to create account in Amazon. If you already have Amazon commercial account, then it is well and good. You can log in with that. Otherwise, this is the home page of it. Get it to the sign in. Okay, so sign in to the console. It will ask your mobile number, sorry, email or password. So if you already have the account in Amazon, in the shopping site, then you can log in with that account, with your email ID, with your password. Otherwise, what you can do is that, uh, just create a new one here, okay, uh, as a new user and register it. It will ask you for your credit card details, give your credit card details and they will charge you INR rupees 2. Okay, and once your account is activated, they will repay your amount. Okay, so that is fine. So now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to log in with my credentials. So in the services, take EC2 because I'm going to take the elastic compute that is nothing but cloud servers. Okay, here it will be like this. You're just going to launch instance. I want to choose the Red Hat. They will provide the whatever the OS you want. Okay, out of this set, I just want the Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So select it. And in that, I need only the micro instance. That is enough. That is only the free tier eligible server. So I'm just review and launching. And here in security groups, here in edit security groups, so Splunk is going to use various ports. Splunk requires some three or four ports, okay? So click on this add rule. So just to keep in mind that Splunk requires 8000 and it requires 8089 to get open. These are all the ports, okay? Server ports. So 9997. These are all the ports required by the Splunk packages. Okay, so you have to open these ports. In real time, 
you are if you are going to buy a phys physical server means you have to contact your admin team and tell them to open the port but here we are the owners of the servers what we are going to build so we uh, open these things by ourselves okay and review and launch okay then launch it will ask for the keeper that is whatever the linux box now i am going to take for that i do not have any passwords instead of passwords i need to upload a key file with that key file only it is going to open my server so what you are going to do is that for the first server alone you have to create a new key pair say for example i am going to create a new okay just give whatever the name you want download key pair the key is going to get downloaded here okay it is in the perm format i will tell you later what to do so the the key is downloaded so now click on the launch instances that's it okay click on here so the instance get launched so you got one linux box okay for that linux box you got that ip address okay and i need to open the server with this ip address and with this key file okay so from windows how i am going to open the linux box using the utility called putty or putty the people some people will use putty or putty so it's nothing but it is the utility through which you are going to open your linux box from windows okay so uh, like this so see here this is one of the server now the state is running the server is running so say for example suppose if i started at 655 and i am going to work in the server until 730 so that uh, after that my work is getting finished okay i need to go out so in that case uh, click on this server and go to this click on this instance go to the action instance state stop this okay you need to stop this server okay because if it is running means it will take the hours so you are going to return at evening 8 o'clock okay so until then your 12 hours is going to get vanished out out of the 750 hours okay but if i am going to stop at 730 means only 1 hour is going to get vanished whatever the hours and work done okay is it clear so um, be be conscious in that take the servers run it okay and do your work do the practicals do the test and stop the servers at once do not waste your uh, free hours because after the 750 hours it is chargeable okay so do not waste the free hours once your work is done close it and uh, stop the servers and close it okay is that clear and one more thing say for example within a single time if i am going to install two servers means every server is going to run for 1 hour so out of that my 2 hours is going to vanish at 7:30 okay say for example um i'm going to install one more instance launch instance select linux box review and launch here i'm going to choose edit security groups and give the ports appropriately review and launch launch now i don't need to create a new pair okay i can choose the choose existing pair and from here i can choose i want to select the new pair itself acknowledge it launch no need to create the new pair for the first time alone you are going to create a new key pair from the second instance onwards you can use the existing key file itself and then launch the instance that's it okay so now see here one server is running one server is pending it's going to run in a few minutes so now i am having two servers when i am going to stop the servers at 730 means the server will take one hour the server will take one hour so two hours is going to vanish and some people will do like that they will log in at 655 they will log in, log off at 710 and they will log in log in at 715 so they will think that for the first 10 minutes and for the first uh, the next will be calculated as the another uh, minute and all so it's not like that if you log in at 655 and log off at 710 means the minimum hour would be 1 hour only not 10 minutes okay so use the instance properly okay so you can utilize more uh, free time with that is everyone clear with amazon instance creation i will tell you how to open the server tomorrow okay but until now is that clear until you get the ip address is that clear and whenever i am going to stop this and if i am going to start it again means i will get different ip because this ip is not static it is a dynamic ip 
okay the on demand provision okay whenever i want i will get an ip from the cloud so now i got this ip so if i'm going to stop this and connect this again means i will get different ip is that clear so i will give this document and go through it and try to launch once instance of your own and one more thing you have to create an account in splunk.com So in Splunk.com, go to the Splunk.com and create an account over there. It is a free uh, account creation. Okay. So do these two activities before next class, and we will see the rest of things in tomorrow's class. Any more doubts here? Any concerns or doubts? So click on this uh, community. Okay. Uh, whatever it is. So here you have the sign up option. Use the sign up option and create an account in Splunk.com. Okay, just do these two activities before next class. Any doubts? You can ping your doubts here. Saraswati, okay, is it fine? Yeah, I'll be providing the materials and I will share this recorded session. Okay. Uh, Saraswati, uh, yes. can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this is Hayman. Uh, uh, like, uh, is there any official uh, documentation from Splunk or uh, any certification exam documentation that we can go through? Uh, Splunk Docs is there. Splunk Docs I will explain because whatever I am taking, everything is covered in Splunk Docs. And this class is also, uh, you can do it for certification also, but we are not going to provide certification. It's not the third party event. This month is not going yeah. to that party, right? So, based on certification also, I can guide you. But I am not 100% sure that I can train you for certification. No, no. Uh, certification is not our, uh, my concern. Or hmm. I am not sure about others, but my concern is not certification. Okay. I am just asking because the certification material or that would be extensive. So, uh, that's why I am asking you. Yeah, what I am providing, okay, uh, it includes all the Splunk uh, 4 or 5 certification except 2. I am going to teach you whatever all the Splunk 5 certification syllabus, even more than that. Okay, so I will provide all the materials and Splunk is having good documentation. So rather than my docs, you, you are able to understand everything in Splunk docs itself. Okay, so what your exact question, I didn't get you. Yeah, that was my question. Like, okay. does Splunk have any documentation? And yeah, yeah, Splunk is having so uh, everything. They are having the docs, so not an issue. So we will we will see the practicals here, and we will take the docs over there. And even I am also having the doc because Splunk is having vast documentation. You will you will not be able to get it through in a single class. So what I am doing, I I have done is that I have make a short notes of it, so you can go through my docs as well as Splunk docs, and then it will be easy for you. Yeah. Uh, co uh, can you start sending those documentation, uh, Saraswati? Yes, yes, sure, sure. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, do it by today. Okay. Okay. And this uh, video session, uh, are you uploading it to Google Drive or? Yes, I'll be uploading in Drive, so you can download to your own uh, local machine uh, from the Drive itself. Okay. 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 Thanks. Okay. Uh, oh, where are Yeah. Uh, like, uh, is there anything like online help or something for Splunk? Because for Tableau, we have some online help where we can see full documentation of Splunk. 
like that in uh, like full documentation of Tableau like that first Plank is there anything? This is the page. So I will I'll forward you the page. This is the online docs. Okay, you can you can see so many uh, documentation in this page. I will forward you the links for you. Okay. Like could you show us that uh, where exactly the documents are located? So see here, this is the page. I have just shown shared my screen right so for each and everything you have the docs for get started search and reporting so the corresponding docs okay so get started is the initial thing then search and like report yes. and yeah I'll call the, the thing is that if you started to read the docs now then it will be very vague to you that's why I won't suggest you to read the docs at this moment Okay, so get into two or three classes, then you can understand the terms, then go to this plum box. Okay? All right, all right, thanks. Okay, that's fine. Okay, then we will meet again at the uh, same time tomorrow. Okay, 6 o'clock, 6 a.m. IST. Okay. So I'll forward this docs link, videos, as, as well as my docs. Okay? Okay, and also uh, that uh, links for uh, how to install, right? Yes, yes, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Uh, uh, Surinder? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, is it clear, right? Yes. Uh, is this a, is there anything before this class? No, no, no. This is the first class. Okay. Just we have taken a demo yesterday. That's it. Okay. This is the first okay. class. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Surinder. One more person has joined with you, right, Ravi? He has left. Uh, okay. That's fine. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Thank Sir. you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye.